This one is inspired from the traditional, you know, hand-painted flags, escal that we have all time. And when I arrived at LV Watches, I uh, had the opportunity to have this on the wrist. And then our, our one of our lead watchmakers, um, Enrico Barbazini, so that's Michel Navas and Enrico Barbazini, which are the two founders of uh, Fabrique du Temps, looked at it and said, mm, we can do better. All right, Jean, thanks for joining us today. For those who might not know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? What do you do here at Louis Vuitton? Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Um, so I've been taking care of uh, watches for Louis Vuitton for now uh, two years. Um, it's been kind of quite an incredible journey. Uh, I've been uh, working for the company now in, in both marketing, development, and now the whole, uh, the whole of watches. Uh, for this period and uh, taking care of uh, everything from you know production all the way down to uh, to marketing and everything like that so great journey speaking of which you know we're in a pretty special place can you tell us where we are yeah so we are at la fabrique du temps today um, and this is where all of our watches are produced all the way from the you know connected watch to the carpe diem and above that uh, we actually recently announced one of our, our unique pieces that, that came out of here and the manufacture was born out of a you know, specialist movement workshop uh, that LV bought out close to 10 years ago now. And uh, now it's evolved in a fully fledged manufacture where we you know, produce our movements, case dials and everything. So it's, uh, it's been uh, quite an evolution since. That's amazing. I think what some people might not know about you is even though your role here is basically to touch watches from beginning to end yourself, you're also a watch collector. And how did you get into watches? Have you been a collector or at least interested in watches since you were a child? I mean, and tell us a little bit about your, your story. Yeah, there. I mean, you know, when I was a kid, I was always interested in watches uh, a bit, bit of the same as, than other parts of the group. So let's say, you know, leather goods, uh, perfume, cosmetics and things. It was, it was for me uh, just another part of the family business. Um, but I was always interested in mechanical things. Uh, wasn't yet into the world of watches, but uh, most in, mostly into planes, cars, and things like that. And then at university, I, I, uh, thanks to you guys, I started uh, looking into watchmaking a little bit more uh, and, and really getting interested in it. So sorry. <laughs> exactly. And so what, I, I won't be the one telling you that as soon as you start getting interested in it, it's a bit of a rabbit hole where you never come out of it. So oh, right. that's what happened to me. And uh, all my preconceived career plans uh, got uh, thrown, in the, thrown in the bin and now uh, I decided to start uh, working in watches and, and uh, hopefully make a career out of it. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's been a, an incredible journey and, and a uh, great passion uh, associated with that. This is a super diverse collection in kind of the best way. It goes from sort of historical to stuff that you just really don't see at all. There's no uh, consistency at all. <laughs> but it, no, but there, I, that's what I think is great is there's consistency to you. So mm. I think each of these sort of appeals to some sensibility that you have. So if you could walk us through some of these uh, in, in honestly whichever order you'd like to. Which one do you prefer? Let's start with it with the LV there. I think it's a great okay. place to start just considering where we are. This watch is the first watch that LV ever made. It's a piece that I bought when I arrived here. Uh, on eBay, nobody really knows about this piece, so it was designed in the 80s by Gary Lenti. One thing that's quite incredible is all the indications that you see on the watch. I mean, it has, I don't know, six or seven different complications. <laughs> yes. Uh, obviously, it's a quartz piece, so it, it remains kind of thin, and the way the strap integration is is quite crazy. I've mentioned it in the past, but that's the watch that convinced us to stop making watches. Explain what that means. So this watch is before LVMH and okay. before Richemont. Uh, why do I say Richemont? Because the movement is from IWC. So okay. it was the first sort of collaboration between two brands, uh, now of two competing groups. But uh, the movement uh, was very complicated to make um, because at the end of the day, we weren't able to produce that many of them. The interest was there, but the watch was super expensive because it's made of solid gold. And LV was not known for its watchmaking. Uh, you can argue that it's still not known for its watchmaking, but it's, we're getting there. Yeah. Uh, but as a first try, I think it was very ambitious and, uh, and not the most uh, commercial success. I mean, it has a classic appeal. It has almost like a pocket watch aesthetic to it yeah. in, in many ways in terms of the case design. But no one would ever call this like a clean dial per no. se. There's a lot going on for sure. There's a lot going on. I mean, it's fun, uh, but again, it, it, it's a bit of a statement uh, wearing it. And the strap integration and everything, I mean, it's, it, it's complete crazy. I, I wear this one, I think, with the one I have on the wrist and with the most often uh, between, between the two. And how do you feel when you wear this watch now that you wear it more often? I mean, it's 
very difficult to read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Time at a glance is not something that you're getting off this one. No, but I mean, exactly. And, and, and again, it's, it, it shows uh, the history of the brand in a sense. And I, I feel proud because I truly believe that this inspired the tambour later on and, and, and started the whole thing. We did have a recess of 20 years of between this one and the tambour. So this one was early 80s. And you can tambour. see the influence though. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, I think it's a, it's a great segue into the way we've launched watches 20 years after that. Um, and there was a great journey between the two. So I it kind of has some historical significance uh, for us. It's theoretically not the very, very first watch we've made. It was the first serial produced watch we've uh -huh. made. And, and I just love the design, you know. I think it would be a good idea to go from the first LV watch to a watch that wasn't really necessarily produced per se mm -hmm. with the FP Shorn. Yeah, I mean, again, completely different. This one is uh, the Octa Reserve de Marche. So at face value, it's one of those watches that you recognize and say, okay, like it's a simple Jour and everything. Of course, if, if there's such thing to say as a simple Jour. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, now it's become, you know, very, very popular and everything like right. that. Um, but uh, it's, it's kind of when you turn it over that you realize what lies behind it. Obviously, it's a brass movement uh, watch. But this one is actually the prototype, so one of three um, known, actually. I think one of three altogether. Yeah. Um, and I fell upon this one quite randomly, um, where someone was like, it was before, you know, the whole Jaune hype and everything, before Chanel actually took 20% in, in the company. And uh, someone was like, oh, you know, there's this prototype that's interesting. Do you want to buy it? And I was like, well, is it real? Is it like a legit thing? You know, the Côte de Genève on this watch are completely off. You know, they're not aligned and they're completely different. I didn't really understand the piece initially. And then, you know, a friend of mine convinced me to, to, to buy it. And I went to, to see Jaune with it uh, to get his, his opinion on it. Uh -huh. and, uh, he looked at it, laughed, and was like, oh my God, I love this watch. Uh, I remember making it, etc." And I asked him, you know, why he put the date wheel in blue? Because usually the date wheels on these watches are black. And he was like, I was experimenting uh, with blue. It didn't end up working, but uh, you know, I, I left it on this watch, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the, the story behind this watch is the dial is actually not original to the watch. It was changed in 03, and I think it belonged to one of the board members of the company. And, you know, it's, he changed the dial in 03 because his dial was completely uh, uh, oxidized and things and it really didn't look like much. But this is kind of my pride and joy. Um, I'm very happy to have bought this uh, at the time I bought it at. And uh, this one's never, never leaving me. It has a unique serial on the case back, yeah? Yeah, yeah. type 00A. That's really something. And to have it verified by Francois Paul is probably pretty special. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I got, I got the, uh, I got the certi uh, certificate for it and everything. Yeah. It's a fun piece. And again, one of those that you wear, people think, okay, it's a drawer, like, great, but mm, you keep the story to yourself. Yeah, and right, that's, and right. that's, that's what I love about these watches as well. People realize, obviously, that the drawer is an important piece in things. It's not sure. the most complicated drawer that's out there, far from it, but still, uh, it, brings, uh, it brings a lot to the table. You know, I want to move from here to another watch because when you talk about the fact that this dial was swapped out in 03, but it doesn't necessarily change what makes the watch special. You have a really interesting Patek uh, in the collection over there that kind of knocked me out when I looked at it, and I'd, I'd love to hear some more about it. This piece is a bit of a special one. I, I actually saw it through a friend of mine. He showed it to me, he was like, you know, it's super interesting, Refer reference 10, it was made in the early 20s and things. It's um, a watch they haven't really produced much of in general, and back then Patek used to make watches for Tiffany. I mean, obviously now you have the double sign sure. and everything like that, but before it used to be just Tiffany and the movement used to say Patek, but yes. not to be any, any co-signature. And this one, from what I've been told, uh, I mean, there's probably one, another one floating out there. I doubt they made a piece unique out of it. But right. this one is the only one in this configuration known with a Patek signature on the top. So there's this array of Art Deco style numerals mm -hmm. that's actually is present within the Tiffany watches, but never with the Patek signature on it. And sometimes you see some with the sub-seconds at six, uh, this one is a very clean look because you don't have the sub-seconds. You have no seconds, yeah. No seconds at all. And, and you know, the watch, just the, the winding of it is, feels so old and, and, and you know, worn out. Uh, this probably falls under the antique yeah. uh, side of things, for sure. I, I, it's, it's seen a, a few touch-ups here and there uh -huh. over the years. You know, there's, it's been serviced in the 70s and, and uh, a couple things on the dial have been updated. Uh, lug was resoldered and stuff, so it's not, you know, the sort of perfect quote-unquote example that's stayed in the safe for, for close to 100 years. But still, uh, I feel like it's, uh, it's one of those time capsules where you think, you know, the condition is quite amazing. You still see the hallmark crisp and clear. And the watch is 100 years old, I mean. Yeah. 
How, how incredible is this? It's it's amazing, and and really, I'd like to stay on that point. I mean, why? in your collecting perspective, does that not bother you? I mean, we talked a bit about how it was Reloom, but Reloom with Tritium. And yeah. that was done over 40 years ago, most yeah. likely, and, and it's aged itself, you know, again. Had I had a watch that was a perfect time capsule from the past in this condition, I don't know if I would have worn it as much, just because I'm afraid of scratching it, yes. wearing it, and, and damaging it. You know, Now I know that there's been a few alterations here and there, uh, and I'm never going to sell it anyway, but right. even if I bring my own uh, alterations uh, in the future, that's, that's fine to me. You know, It's beautiful now, really enjoy wearing it, and, and that's for me the key to, yeah. to, to collecting as well as ensuring that you have a watch that's, uh, that you're able to wear. Of course, and, and the case back I think is also pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, there, there are two things. One, they put the Patek logo upside down. Uh, so I believe that would, might, might have been a mistake. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's, it's been verified by Patek and everything is fine. Uh, and there's one of the one hallmark as well from Geneva back in back in the 20s, which has a, a deer on it, which I think was only used for a couple of years and things. So it really shows that the watch was produced in 1926 and yeah. everything is, is legit. But I love this design, you know. I think we should stick with Patek for, for, for the time being because this is quite different from the other one in your collection, I would say. Again, a vintage one, but not from not from the same era. Yeah, um, a little later in time. Yeah, I mean, kind of a holy grail to me. Uh, perpetual calendar chronograph is is probably the most iconic complication at Patek. And this, the story behind this watch is actually quite quite fun as well. Uh, this was a COVID find. Um, okay. I, I was. Uh, I love this phrase, COVID find. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a watch I found on, on online, and I was looking into um, second series, thirty nine seventies. I was really into it. I was really looking at yellow gold, rose gold, and stuff. But the platinums and the uh, white gold ones are are quite difficult to find. I haven't done that many of them, and especially with those large hallmarks, which uh, are, are quite crazy. I love the Dauphine hands with those sort of baton markers and stuff. Yeah. And it's not something you see very, very often. And so really started digging deep, looking at articles, looking at people posting them and stuff, and saw a guy from, from France, actually, that was uh, posting this online, and thought to myself, you know, I, I, I need to find this, I need to get one. Started texting him, and, yeah. and he was like, "Oh, you know, I don't wear it that much." I was like, "Okay, well, sell it to me." Yeah. He's like, well, "I'm <laughs> not so sure about it. You no, know, we've, we've met online, and let's let's try to get to know each other a little bit more." Sure. So, um, met the guy, super nice, a great collector. And then, you know, when I showed the renewed interest in this in this piece, he was like, "You know what? I never wear it. I'll sell it to you, and um, you can get it serviced and, and wear it." So. That one I wear quite often. The condition's also incredible. And you know, the whole marks and things and the movement, I mean, yeah. it's just everything's incredible with that. I'd like to take a look at the longa because mm -hmm. it's just sort of like shimmering at me and I think that <laughs> it's, it's just <laughs> begging to be talked about at this point. Yeah, I mean, I'm not usually a longa fan, but that's the watch that made me discover the brand altogether because of the dial. So this one I feel is like the most whimsical of them all. Yes. So it's the first time I've seen an adventuring dial on a, on a watch. It's probably was made before as well, but still, it's the first time I've seen it in such a great, great length. Um, love the watch and, and that's how I fell in love with the, the movements of, of longer in the first place. Obviously the German silver, all the finishing and everything. Everything about this watch is superlative. Um, and the fact that they put as much attention as in their entry level as in their, you know, uh, uh, grand comps is, is quite incredible to me. So. It's a great, actually it's a daily wear. People say it's a cocktail watch and everything no, that, like that. that's an everyday watch yeah. for me. And, yeah. and, and I really, really enjoy wearing it because it just sparkles. People ask questions about of it. Of course. And, and the hands are just beautiful. The interaction, you can read the time super well. It's one of those crazy pieces that I, that I really, really like. Going into a different direction here, there's a watch that most people might not really know about. This one is an only watch actually uh, from a brand called Crayon. It's a really recent brand. They launched uh, three, four years ago, I think, um, right before COVID. Uh, they launched a watch called the Everywhere, which could allow you to set the sunset and sunrise time from anywhere in the world. But then they recently launched this, which is the Anywhere, which allows you to predefine, you know, a, a place where you want the sunset and sunrise to be set. So mine is set for Paris, and uh, it tells you the um, sunset and sunrise time at any point uh, during uh, during the year. Okay. So this one is quite incredible because it's got sort of this metier d'art, uh, which um, is inspired by a Monet painting. They told me 
I didn't want to tell me which Monet painting it was, but apparently it was inspired from that. And that doesn't actually say the, the, their name on the dial, it only says only watch. And I find that quite, a, quite an incredible piece. When I first saw it, it was, it was really insane. And when I first wound it, I was amazed by the sound it makes. Yeah. And, and you can hear it from across the room, you know? So, so I was really, uh, really incredible. And they told me later on that, you know, it was, there was a whole work around uh, making sure that the winding would be the most crisp possible and, and, and the best way to do it. So it's not the most mechanically efficient way to make it, but it's the most personally satisfying way to make it. So that would, that's what I found quite incredible with the, with the piece as well. Yeah. That's amazing. It sounds so good. I was playing with it earlier. Yeah. Movement finishing is insane. It is. You know, there's like a whole different backstory behind the way they make the finishing itself. So it's not traditional Côte de Genève. They call it Côte de Neuchâtel, which mimics the path of the sun from sunset to sunrise at all different times during the year. And part of their main bridge mimics the coast of uh, Lake Neuchâtel, uh, where their offices are, etc., etc. So this whole storytelling around it, uh, which is uh, which is quite incredible. All right. So from one only watch to another only watch. Tell us a little bit about what's on your wrist now. So um, this one is inspired from the traditional, you know, hand-painted flags, escal that we have all time. And when I arrived at LV Watches, uh, I had the opportunity to have this on the wrist uh, and wore it for, for a couple months. And then our, our one of our lead watchmakers, um, Enrico Barbazini, so there's Michel Navas and Enrico Barbazini, which are the two founders of Fabrique du Temps, looked at it and said, mm, we can do better. Oh, it's wow. Like, okay, interesting. <laughs> so I was on the road trip with him uh, going to see, uh, see a supplier. Yeah. And on the way back, he was like, you know, we can do better, etc. cetera. Enrico is always very uh, uh, expressive in his opinions and stuff. And then I was like, okay, you know what? So I was driving, took it off my wrist, gave it to him. He was like, I'll trust you. Don't tell me what you're going to do with it, but then I trust you'll do better. So just to be clear, the, 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 the normal execution of this watch is, is hand painting the flags around the dial. It's exactly. a very intensive process. Of, like a macro process. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it takes around three weeks to make a dial. Uh, so there's 37 different colors uh, on the hand-painted version. And there's also this attention in the hand-painted version of making sure that the flags have volume to it, uh, where you can really feel like it's, uh, it's, it's hand-painting and not just uh, stamping on the, yes. on the dial and stuff. So there's a huge attention to detail in there. And uh, even then he decided to say, okay, well, we, we can do better. And um, came back around three, four months later and uh, said to me, okay, so we, we finished your watch and uh, came up with this. So he removed the center part of the dial, changed it with a guilloché center, added a hand. So changed the movement for it, uh, had to add a few holes and pinions and stuff, changed the disc for the hours and obviously the flags uh, is now made of uh, Geneva enamel. So it's a mix between the Geneva technique and cloisonné, uh, where you got to make sure that obviously the enamel doesn't mix between each other and, and doesn't create, you know, a sort of a, a mush uh, pattern. Sure. And so our enamel enameler had to take two or three tries before he could uh, uh, perfectly uh, master that. But it's a great piece to. It jumps piece. off the dial from a distance, but when you put it like under a loop or next to your face, the detail in the enameling is is. It's insane. Yeah, it's crazy. And obviously all the flags are enamel, but also all the names for the different cities are enamel as well. And I can't describe how, you know, this sort of reflection that comes to it as well. It brings some depth. Yes. Um, uh, and and it, it feels like, you know, you, you have this sort of glass sheet uh, on top of it, which is uh, which is quite uh, quite crazy. And the fact that the dial is so close to the, to the sapphire as well brings this sort of screen uh, uh, vibe to the watch where yes. you don't actually feel like it's a watch with a dial and everything like that because the hand is so close to the to the sapphire and, and the, the flags as well. It's amazing. All right, I want to round things off with a with not even a watch, a, a timekeeping device that's not actually here. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty esoteric and it takes an actual collector to even want to pursue <laughs> something like this. I'll say nothing else and let you take it from here. Um, so this one, like, uh, obviously I couldn't bring it here because of the sheer size of it and everything, but uh, it's a Patek uh, T2 modular timing system. So obviously in the 60s, Seiko comes in with the quartz technique. And, sure. Uh, crisis in the watch industry, everybody knows that. Um, and Patek came out of it thinking, okay, we need to enter quartz like crazy and, and uh, go at it 100%. So what came out of it was those huge towers of modular timing systems that 
were uh, assembled in racks, you know, of sure. different different types of, uh, of timing mechanisms that you could put in it. It comes of all different shapes and sizes, um, with with all different, you know, because it's modular, you can add and remove stuff mm -hmm. however you want, depending on the uses. And from what I understand, in the 70s, uh, 60s, and 70s, it was used by government officials. It was used in airports. It was used, you know, to in nuclear power plants and stuff like that to to really time uh, those um, important either meetings or uh, nuclear reactions yeah. and stuff like that. It's so incredible. It was used as kind of the reference time. It, it used to lose 0.2 seconds a month, so which was the most accurate they could do back then. And we take it for granted today, but back in the day having the most accurate time was kind of the thing that people were looking for. You know, mechanical timepieces were uh, not as accurate as, as coarse timepieces. And so this for me is probably my, my most incredible piece. Uh, but where is it going? Where, so where, where, it, where will it, it end It's going up? either in my office or at my place. It really depends on what place I can fit it in. And that one specifically was actually used in a German nuclear power plant for 20 years. And, and finding one of those uh, was uh, Quite crazy. I, I knew of them, uh, but as soon as I saw that one was available, I really started researching deep into it. So I'm, I'm happy that uh, I was able to feature it here. I think with this collection and, and all the rest, it shows that I'm interested in watchmaking in general uh, and not necessarily just specific brands or anything like that. It's just uh, the art of time telling. Uh, well, things that work, right? Things that actually serve a function, things that you'll use. Mm, no, for sure. And, and it's just also an art piece and watchmaking is, is an art in itself. So what is it about watches in general that attracts you? Is it an aesthetic ideal? Is it the mechanics? Is it a combination of both? What I find interesting in watches compared to other, let's say, luxury products is that it works as a whole. So. The watch will be a great watch if it has the right movement for the right case with the right dial in the right hands, but it might have the right movement in the wrong case or the right case in the wrong movement and then the equilibrium is off and, and the watch doesn't work, you know, or it doesn't fit, feel right or fit right and everything like that. And I think that's what really attracts me with watches as a whole is because the product itself has to be well-rounded and perfectly fit in proportion, fits on the wrist and everything like that. And the fact that there are so many unique variations of it, right? So I'm not looking after the, uh, what I call the pancake of saying, you know, you've had 17 complications in right. there and trying to put as many mechanics inside. You know, it's about the equilibrium of saying, you've managed to put a minute repeater in a 2.7 millimeter movement. Uh, that for me is quite incredible, more than saying, put a perpetual calendar with a repeater plus this, this and that, and then the watch is uh, 18 millimeters thick, you know. For sure, is story important to you in a watch or would you prefer to have the story begin with you? A bit of both. Obviously, I, I like vintage pieces more around the movement again and design and things, but the fact that it belonged to this such and such or that it uh, uh, came from you know uh, uh, this different era or things like that, um, it's not my main driver, you know. I'm, I'm really looking into, uh, first of all, reliable watches, <laughs> making sure that I yes. can wear them without thinking about servicing and things like that, and ensuring as well that, you know, it's, it has uh, some, some sort of uh, aesthetic appeal. What, if you can even say, now that you're sort of wearing a few more LV pieces these days, is there something that excites you? A watch that, that you have your eye on, I hate to say grail watch, but Maybe just something that, that that's exciting you these days. Mm, or, or you know, I'm really, really getting into clock making. Okay. Um, so one grail for me would be uh, the one of those dome clocks from Patek uh, with sure. the enamel and everything like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm super excited about the pieces that we're going to release in the future. I mean, it seems cliche, but you guys will see. Uh, yeah. there's, there's some super exciting pieces that are coming in the next few I'd years. I'd be worried if you weren't excited about no, the pieces I you're mean, releasing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and, and I'm not uh, ashamed to say that I will be collecting them myself uh, and, and buying them and everything like that because at the end of the day, these are watches that I'm, I worked on and I, I, I really enjoy. Um, and so these are the pieces that I'm most excited about. Well, thank you, Jean. This was really amazing just to even like, you know, open the LV box and show us your, your collection. Thank you very much for having me. It was, yeah. it was uh, really amazing. It's uh, great and humbling to be able to show the, the collection of Talking Watches and I'm super proud of this. It's great. I'd love if we could maybe uh, explore uh, Le Fabrique du Temple a little bit together. Yeah, yeah. a pleasure. That would be great. Great. So tell me about the Louis Vuitton watch prize. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an initiative we started uh, a couple months ago. Okay. Uh, we announced it in, in November and the idea is, you know my love for independent watchmaking. Of course. Right? Uh, and so the idea behind that was to promote independent watchmaking as much as possible and bring an initiative forward um, that LV, uh, such a large brand that has a, a great value and, and uh, reconnaissance in the industry, could help independent watchmaking uh, carry forward. And the idea is really to bring any newcomer, anyone that wants to start uh, their own journey in independent watchmaking to present you know, their first product to the prize and uh, potentially you know, win, uh, win obviously a, ca a cash prize, but also have some kind of mentorship from either La Fabrique du Temps uh, sure. or even members of the committee of experts that we've gathered that are willing to give uh, to give that mentorship. So it's LV super stays completely outside of all of it. Okay. Um, we are just a facilitator in the whole process. We don't vote for anything. We don't take any decisions. Um, the committee of experts, which are all independent from LV, do that. Um, and yeah, the goal is really to to bring that uh, bring that part of the industry forward.